humble origins of the car giants. But first, back to our best seller, the Ford Focus. This is the best car in the world. This is definitely the best family car on the market. The Focus wins, hands down. What a superb family car. Now, the press corps' love of the Focus is well documented. But what does the rest of the world think? We've been carrying out a few inquiries to get some different perspectives. I think it's interesting how it's changed. When, when you first saw this car come out, it looked really quite dramatic. And to be put on a driveway such as this in a salubrious suburb, I think a lot of people have looked out the window and gone, what the devil's that? But um, no, I think as time has rolled on, it's, it looks quite classy now. When you see a guy driving around in this, or a woman driving around, it's just, they're sitting a little bit more upright, I've noticed. They're a little bit sharper. They seem to, they seem to feel better about themselves. I mean, if this was a person, yeah. it would probably be Martin Kemp. Do you think? A bit sharp, a <laughs> little bit sharp. You yeah. Know? Probably some... Uh, a little bit of violence in the family somewhere, <laughs> although he's obviously perfectly nice about it. Of course. And there's an interesting line down the side here, mm. which is this one that starts here and goes all the way to the back. If you look at it from the side, it's diving into the ground. It gives it a bit more forward punch. Right, what's the inside telling us about this car? It's clear that there's a lot of styling cues that are carried over from the outside that come together here. Really, what they're trying to do is to put the quality where it really counts. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the handshake of the car, the gear lever. Yeah. And although this one's a bit leathery, it's, it feels about 20 years old to me. And, and the lower model, it's a nasty plastic thing. That's something you touch all the time. Mm -hmm. For my money, that should be the best bit of the <laughs> best bit of the experience. Everything you're touching here, how yeah. that clicks, how that feels, how that works basically is what makes a car and I think in this case they didn't do it. There's all sorts of stuff in a car that will contribute to how you feel about it mm. and one good example of it might be this light for instance. If I close the door it goes out slowly mm -hmm. like that. Now for some reason that feels good and yeah. then you've got this which does this. Now an expensive tape deck goes like that. It doesn't go like that. And a lot of companies have worked on this, for themselves have worked on it quite a lot, so that that might be damped. Yeah. Now again, there's no real technical purpose as to why that should be softer than that, or why that light goes out slowly. It's about feeling good. Mm -hmm. So from a design point of view, do you think Ford got it right with the Focus? I think that Ford did a remarkable job here. I think the sales figures alone prove that they got it pretty much right with the Focus. There's some details that make me shriek a little bit, but then they mm -hmm. usually are. But hey, you know, good job. Well, because it was perceived to be a more at market car, the residual values would have been anticipated that they would have been higher. But since then, we've had price realignment. And uh, today, for a typical, possibly three year old example, you would expect to pay a little less than £7,000 for an average mileage car in nice condition. If you're in the market for, for a Focus, colour is very important. Uh, to you it might not be, but certainly in time to come when you're looking to sell a car, it is colour uh, and, and certainly air conditioning is becoming more and more a necessity. Best model to go for would be the 1.6 LX mid-range model. All the features that people are looking for, power steering, electric windows, preferably metallic, air conditioning, good value, everything you require. But if nothing beats brand new for you, then take a look at the prices we found for a 1.6 five-door ZTEC. On the internet, the average price was about ten and a half grand, whilst at a supermarket you'd pay around 9,700. A dealer should be able to get one for 11,500 or import one from Europe for 9,900. You pay your money, you take your choice. Well, that's how to buy, but what about those who have already bought? You can't throw a stone in a car park without hitting a Focus. There are 1.2 million owners worldwide, so it's about time we speak to a few of them. And the opinions we sought were those of that much maligned group, the women drivers. I am late for the children. Um, <laughs> can you tell me why you bought your Focus? What was it about it? Sorry to trouble you. We're, I'm filming for BBC Top Gear. How are you getting on with your Focus? I like the style of it. Mm -hmm. I had yeah, some good reports about it. You had a very good write-up for, um, for safety. The boot's good. The cool. boot's really good. It's got a high ceiling and I'm tall and I don't smack my head when I drive. Petrol consumption. It's very reliable. It handles very well. Um, it's a car with a larger engine that a lady can move easily. It's really powerful. <laughs> cool. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. <gasps> Do 
I talk to your daughter at all? <laughs> Not my daughter, she's my sister. Oh, are you? Hello. Hello. If yeah. you could change anything about it, what would you change? The, um... Viewing is not very good at the back window. There's um, a point where you can't see through the back. Do you really buy the colour yellow because they match your outfits? <laughs> well, I think I've lost the keys though. <laughs> the focus comes in blue or blue? Yeah, it goes one of those. Yeah. I've just done it, mate. You're in shot. <laughs> I think I have really lost them. <laughs> you got some space What's about your there? pocket? I've got one for Ronka. I'm wonderful for my sister because we've got leather seats. For getting in and out, she can slide in and out because she's like, you know, she can see we've got the orange stickers. On. Yeah, so, mega. Uh, wonderful. Good, rock oh, on yeah. for leather seats. Here they are, got them. Hey. them. <laughs> Always late. Do you know what? You're late for the kids. I'll take this Thank back. You no very worries. Much. <laughs> Bye. So the nation has spoken. We've asked the audience, and the answer is focus. But don't go for broke just yet. Wait for part three where we'll be comparing the focus against its competition. It may pay to be a little bit wiser and not follow the crowd. Chances are, if you asked a bicycle repairman or a sewing machine engineer to fix your car nowadays, they'd be as stuffed as the rest of us. But in truth, the modern car owes everything to these people. 120 years ago, when the first car arrived, pioneering engineers applied their knowledge of producing such things as coffee grinders to make the first cars, and some of them still haven't completely given up their past. 100%. Think of Peugeot nowadays and flashes of rally cars steaming through forests and cheeky hatchbacks weaving their way through town come to mind. But the company which defines French motoring actually has its history steeped in flour. The Peugeot brothers were descended from Millers, but with a can-do-anything approach, typical of the time, they started getting to grips with a newfangled bicycle. Despite spending the rest of the century making cars, Peugeot have maintained their two-wheeled routes and today run celebrated cycling teams. Forget the bone shakers of yesteryear because now it's lightweight aluminium frames, sequential STI gear changes and slick racing tyres. But Peugeot weren't the only bicycle manufacturer to get in on the game. At the turn of the century in Czechoslovakia, Laurent and Clement were making the two-wheel forerunners of Skoda cars. Meanwhile, in Oxford, William Morris put his bicycle repair business on hold in order to make his first motorcycle, and by 1913, he produced his first car, the Morris Oxford. But it wasn't just bike manufacturers that were cashing in. Toyota, now the world's third largest motor manufacturer, was formed comparatively late in 1937 as a spin-off from the Toyota Automatic Loom Works. And even though they now produce four and a half million cars a year, you can still buy a Toyota sewing machine, or speedboat, or forklift truck. Two very important players in today's market have the aviation industry to thank for their beginnings. Everyone knows Alfa Romeo for their illustrious motoring heritage, but they actually began by producing cars and aeroplanes simultaneously in 1910. BMW also cut its teeth in the skies, starting off in 1916 making aero engines followed by motorbikes and then cars. Today it's actually going back in time as it started producing mountain bikes and even skateboards. The war proved to be a real turning point for all these fledgling car companies. Suddenly they were turned over to the war effort and started to compete on a much more physical scale. Bloody Messerschmitt drivers! <laughs> Rolls-Royce powered Spitfires fought Mercedes in the Battle of Britain. Fiat was also requisitioned for the Luftwaffe and Mitsubishi engines powered Japanese Zero fighters. After the war in 1948, a Japanese mechanic by the name of Sachiro Honda founded the Honda Bike Company. Staggeringly, it wasn't until 1963 that the first Honda car saw the light of day. All the rest, power boats, Formula One and world domination was to follow, including some seriously dodgy dancing robots. But despite all this, Honda still find the time to sell over 4 million power products each year. Water pumps, generators, outboards and lawnmowers. 
These days, no one would think that their fellow Japanese giant Mitsubishi was so off the mark. But despite trading in everything from chemicals to clothing since 1870, they didn't start making cars until 1970. The past 30 years has seen further Far Eastern dominance. Korea has followed the Japanese lead by creating huge companies that produce everything from oil tankers to neckties, with a range of cars that are slowly gaining international respectability. But amongst all the tales of humble beginnings and diversification, it's the story of Ferruccio, the diesel tractor manufacturer from Italy, that sticks out the most. He returned after the war to convert military machines into agricultural hardware, finally producing his very own top quality tractors. After much success, he indulged in several Ferraris to celebrate his good fortune, only to end up complaining to Enzo Ferrari himself that he didn't do much of the gearboxes. Enzo's reply was terse. You stick to tractors, and I'll stick to sports cars. Instead, Ferruccio started his very own sports car company, Lamborghini. And the rest is history. Coming up on Top Gear, electric performance and zero emissions. Switch on to the amazing Kaz. And the Ford Focus faces up to the competition. Now, there's lots of people out there who think exhaust emissions contribute to global warming. So there's lots more people trying to work on cars with so-called zero emissions. And the one that's caught Top Gear's imagination the most is this, the CAS concept. Italian design house, Idea Institute, have really gone to town on this one, making it unlike any electric car you've ever seen. It's seven metres long with eight wheels and eight motors. Each unit is actually housed within a wheel. Now this bonkers arrangement minimises any transmission loss and means there's much more space within the body for batteries. The problem with electric cars up to now has been their poor range and piddling top speed. But the CAS changes all that. How far does IDEA reckon you can go on one charge? Bet now! Yes, 300 kilometres. And with the addition of a fuel cell, that could double. But its best trick has to be performance. It's got 600 brake horsepower and will go from 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds. Yes, I know it looks like a slug, but it's no slouch. Around the Nardo test track in Italy, it clocked nearly 200 miles an hour. And weren't they proud? Sadly though, there's no exhaust note to match. Being electric, it doesn't make a sound. Still, a 200 mile an hour people carrier, the future's worth waiting for. So, the focus is brilliant. That seems to be the consensus of opinion. But don't think that means it gets things all its own way, because this is the most closely fought market sector of the lot. And there are uh, one or two other things here that you uh, might be tempted by. The heavyweight name in this sector is the Volkswagen Golf. If you prefer blue blood to blue collar, then this is the one for you. It's still the classiest car in the sector, but it's lost that youthful sparkle it was once famous for. Whereas the Citroen Zara was born middle-aged. So why does it sell so well? Two reasons. It's very comfy and great value for money. But aggressive pricing doesn't make up for the fact that it feels a little bit dated and looks just a little bit naff. Another supple riding French affair is the Renault Megane, which always shows well in the sales charts, if only because the statisticians include the numbers of its more distinguished MPV brother, the Scenic. Then there's the little big cars, the Honda Civic and Peugeot 307. The Honda's massive inside, but frankly, a bit aesthetically challenged. The 307 is much more handsome, but surprisingly cramped in the back. You pays your money. 
which leaves us with the second best seller in the sector, the Vauxhall Astra. A perfectly decent motor car, with an impressively roomy cabin, chunky build quality and a chassis that's been sprinkled with Lotus Fairy Dust, and yet it lives in the Focus's shadow. Question is, should it? I actually quite like the Astra. It's nice to drive, it's all there, it's not fussy, it just works. This is a better car to drive than the, uh, than than the, the Golf. Golf. It but, is, yeah. but, it, but I mean, it's, it's as solid on the inside as the Golf. I'm gonna give it the Simpson whack. But uh, it's just not as nice to look at. It's not, it's not a, a status symbol as the Golf, is it? It just isn't a car you're ever gonna fall in love with. Some punter posted a, a, a little chat room thing about this moron Simpson. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He reckons that the Astra is you better than... You got my message then. <laughs> but he reckons the Astra is better than the Golf, but pound for pound it is. This makes a brilliant second-hand buy. Yeah. Because you can pick up one with, well, not very many miles on it, three years old for well under eight grand. Yeah. Yeah. It's all there. You've got your CD player, you've got air conditioning. It's nice to drive. It's, I mean, it's more chuckable than the Golf if you're in oh, that definitely. sort of thing. It works perfectly well. The steering's good. The yeah. handling's good. And it's also got a good range of engines as well, isn't it? It's got the... Uh, well, this is the 2.2. It's probably one of the strongest points. Exactly. You'd be happy with this, Barlow. Performance demon that demon, I have. Demon, yeah, yeah. I like it. Um, I do like it in spite of it looking so uncool. I'd quite happily tool around in an Astra. I, I would say that, hand on heart. If it was my money mm. and I had to spend it, um, I second would. Second hand though, not new. Is it second hand? I wouldn't buy one new. Mm. You're crazy. The thing about the Ford Focus is that it's just so complete, you know? In fact, it's not only complete but it actually is the best in its class in a number of key ways. I think it's got the best steering and the best balance between a nice comfortable ride and sort of laser honed kind of handling. I agree with that, that it's probably the, the, the most finished article out of all of them. It hasn't dated, you know, it still looks slightly odd, but it looks good. Yeah, you I know, agree. When you, when you pass one or one passes you on the road, you think that is a nice bit of design. The, the one problem I have got with it is that I think they've tried just a bit too hard with all the uh, dash and the layout. I think it seems awkward. Usually it would be incumbent on me to completely disagree with you, Adrian, just for the sake of it. But, Come on, Barlow. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to completely agree with you. On day one, I hated the interior, yeah. and, and time has not changed my mind. But, I mean, it works on just so many more levels in design, doesn't it? Because actually driving, the Ford really hit the spot about five years ago. They started making absolutely superb driver's cars, which were family cars. Everybody wants them. They're pouring out of the showrooms new. Used dealers can't get enough of them. Even the Americans, who normally can't stand sort of compact Europe European hatchbacks, are tripping over themselves to buy this car. They had big boots to fill, and it filled them. It's a winner. So, the Focus is ace, and richly deserves its place at the top of the sales chart. Still don't think there's one for you? Then take a look at this. The Focus ST170, which all being well, should once again raise the stakes in the hot hatch sector. This is one of only two cars in existence, but Top Gear has been the first to get hold of it to kick its tyres. Unfortunately, that's about all we can do with it for now, because the final production versions won't be ready to drive until March next year, by which time we'll be salivating at the prospect of the even faster Focus RS. There's even talk of a Focus Coupe and a Focus Cosworth. So while the Focus might look as though it's had a charmed life up to now, the best is yet to come. Next week on Top Gear, small and perfectly formed, but is the GT2 Porsche's best ever road car? Identical twins, why two engines can be better than one. And does the Freelander still get top marks on the school run?